Good afternoon, ladies, and thank you very much for attending the first lecture of the 34th Chen Wu Lecture in History and Culture of New Asia College. Today's lecture is jointly organized by the Department of History and New Asia College. We are extremely honored to have invited Professor Nicholas Standard, Professor of Sinology, University of Newman, Belgium, to give us a talk on joining the global public in the early and mid Qing dynasty. The Chinese Gazette in European sources. We are also very delighted to have Professor Lan Yun Sun, Emeritus Professor, Department of History of CUHK, to be the moderator of this lecture. So, without further delay, I will now pass over to Professor Lan to introduce the speaker and start the lecture today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, who are here for our face-to-face or in-person lecture on for about three years. Uh, Professor Nick, a well-renowned sinologist, Blue University in Belgium, has been nominated as our distinguished Chen Wu lecturer four or five years ago. That was a long time ago. Huh? Uh, but then uh, because of the uh, pandemic and because of all this restriction, and then I have had a person today to deliver three years about cross or intercultural and and actually the area who is a leading scholar in the he has done much research on the Jesuits in uh, the problems they encountered. In fact, I think the first book uh, was published in, 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 in the 80s. At that time, when I was doing research on another uh, Chinese scholar, uh, Li Zizhao, so maybe a few years earlier. So uh, in the end, I think I published only an article on Li Zizhao and how he dealt with the Jesuits. The professor student, I think, a thick book on Yang Ting Yun. The book turned Catholic, turned to Christian. So we share a lot of, you know, uh, research, just, you know, income. I'm glad I think I do a Chen Wu fellowship. Uh, for, for a week, maybe a little week. <laughs> Professor Standard's recent project, print we have uh, graduate students, colleagues who are interested in print culture. In fact, at the library, I think this week, sent a grand exhibition on the manuscripts uh, written by uh, European Jesuits and also Chinese scholars during that time. So, uh, after this, you can go ahead and to the, to our main library uh, for and also the rights and uh, controversy. I think I, he has written a book and also here yeah, uh, of interaction or intercultural exchange, especially the concept of in between. I think which we share also as a interest in cultural history. Now, without much. Uh, I do. I, I, I will give the time and the stage to Professor Nicholas Standard for his uh, the list of his publications and his uh, awards and honors. Please read that the book the book that we time to. So good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction. In the first place, I would like to express my very sincere. Thanks to the uh, head of the New Asia, uh, uh, to uh, the Dean of the Faculty of uh, History, to Professor uh, for to, I feel extremely honored to uh, have been elected uh, by the lectures. The duty we have to wait a year. I'm very happy to say that I cherish this um, yeah, very much uh, and even 
or because I cherish also the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I do not say this simply by kind of politeness. First time I came here was in 1982. I went to Manhattan, in Fudan, and I was one week before here in, um, in uh, Hong Kong, and I visited the city. And then in the uh, early 90s, looking here at China News Analysis, and so I often came to the library, and later on I had several occasions uh, to come here uh, for conferences, and for me, this always has been an extremely fruitful uh, occasion for encounter, exactly uh, the type of uh, encounters uh, that I dream of or that I do research on in my own uh, field of uh, studies. Uh, Professor Lung already mentioned that uh, yeah, I was or I'm still interested, among other things, in uh, print culture. And so I wanted to investigate uh, how in the intercultural contact between China and Europe, uh, how important the role of print culture was, because missionaries came here and they did have to bring a printing press because everything was present in China. And within that context, I was just wondering, did the missionaries read the official gazette? And I thought, oh, I will spend maybe one or two weeks on that topic because there will not be a lot of material. And then I moved to another topic. But I spent three years on that topic. And that's what I would like to present today. And thanks, I would say, thanks to COVID, I would, could even publish a book about it. <laughs> so it will be uh, in the context, um, the topic basically will be a presentation or a re articulation of my uh, latest uh, book. So here, that's the, the cover of the book. It's published by Brill. And you see the different chapters, but I'm not going through all the different chapters uh, today. Let me first as a kind of introduction, point out that there recently, in the last few years, the last 20, 30 years, there has been a renewed interest in this topic of uh, the Gazette, what we call the Gazette, the Di Bao, uh, often called King Bao. I come back on that term a bit later. Uh, and there are also other terms with kind of nuances, Chao Pao, and so on and so on. So you see a number of uh, Chinese scholars who have been investigating that topic, uh, especially uh, the series by uh, Fang Han Qi uh, and other scholars, uh, and some of his uh, students who also made their dissertation on that topic. And also in the West, uh, there have been several studies on the uh, Gazette. Um, and as Mokos uh, pointed, points out, uh, there have been different approaches. You can study it from the point of view of the press, history of the press, or the history of the state, how a, a gazette can uh, work at state building, or uh, uh, the history of information in society, how it is circulated. So among these recent publications, uh, you see the different types. Uh, you had uh, Barbara Mittler on the history of the press, and then you have Hilde de Weert on the Song Dynasty, and that's more the information. And then the latest book also by Emily uh, Mokros, uh, that is more the late imperial uh, China. Uh, and in fact, after 1800, our information about the Gazette is quite extensive. Also in terms of translations, because there have been a lot of translations of it. And in Brill, you have even a whole website uh, with uh, 8,500 pages uh, uh, that is online and that you can uh, consult in that uh, regard. The point is that before 1800, the gazettes that are left over are extremely few. Basically, it's only from the Qianlong period. And as you know, Qianlong, it's 60 years of reign. And you only have about 394 copies of the Gazette left over. So that means a little bit more than one year and a half. By comparison, 
we should not exactly make the comparison, but uh, you have European gazettes from, uh, or newspapers from before 1800, you have sometimes complete sets. But in China, it is rather limited. And even here, what is called the Tipo from the Yongzhong period, it's not really a Tipo. So um, what is then the problem? The problem is that scholars, actually also, we protect our project, the name and the knowledge we have about the Gazette from be, be, beyond or after 1800, we project that on the earlier period. And we use the name King Pao, and we use the concept and the format and so on and so on on the time before. Or another way, like for instance, Hilda Duway, where it, uh, the, we check secondary uh, sources, uh, for instance, the diaries, the notebooks, the novels, to see what information is caught in it on the Gazette. Uh, for instance, we know on the basis on a PT uh, that someone three or four, four months later than the, um, than the death of uh, Matteo Ricci says, I read in a pau the death of Matteo Ricci. And that's a very indirect information. So my question was, can we find some information about the Gazette in Western sources? It's not a preference for Western sources because I mainly work on Chinese sources, but that was my simple question. Um, and can we even find maybe some of the pre-1800 Chinese versions also in European libraries. So extremely simple uh, question. I'm not the first, as some other people have been working on it as well. So in terms of methodology, and there you see the types of methodology that I try to use, is the concept of looking at a culture from the periphery. I adopt the concept from the Institute uh, of Fudan uh, the uh, Wen Shi Yan Yu Yan, Ge Zhao Guang has already published about that. So let us look at Chinese history from the point of view of European sources or sources that are hidden in European libraries. But it can, and you will also see that I also use some uh, Korean uh, sources for it. And moreover. Maybe the sources not only inform us about China, but also about how Europeans who lived in China read these sources, how was their reaction, what did they do with it. And so on. Moreover, another concept is the so-called interconnected history, is to see, once we have the sources, to what extent is this King Paul, is this a T Paul, connected and used, for instance, also in Europe. Uh, did European, and I'm not talking about uh, European missionaries in China, but did European intellectuals, savants, use these sources? So these were my basic research questions. First, a final point in terms of methodology. So I've discovered quite a number of European sources. The first point then is what is the, the information in these European sources? Is that correct information? In order to know that, I should have access to the Chinese sources, which I do not have. So what I, I did kind of bypass, namely, this is the typo, and then you have European manuscripts, and some of these European manuscripts were published. And the problem is that we don't have the original typo, except for about eight. I come back on that later. So I bypassed it and I tried to identify the records in the Sholu to see what was mentioned in this Gazette maybe appears in the Sholu. But the Sholu is not the basis of the Tipao, because the Shalu is published or written much later. And the Tipao was usually a few days after the event and with the emperor. They published or they wrote, or maybe one month later, but the Shalu is uh, in, historically much later. 
So what are the basis of the Shelu and of the Tipao that are the Qi Qi Zhu and the, uh, the Shang Yu? So when I had a record in the Shelu, I tried to find it in the Qi Qi Zhu and the Shang Yu. And then I could check whether it was the right uh, 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 origin. So very concretely, uh, you see a manuscript here, and then you can see, for instance, that's in French, uh, C1, 5,000, 600. And so then I tried with the databases. And so I found a record with the names. This is French translation, uh, uh, pinyin of that time. And then I could find it in the Chitujiu and in the, um, and in the uh, Shangyu, uh, Shangyu Dang. Uh, you have the same with printed sources. Uh, this is a reference to, uh, for instance, He Shen, uh, the famous uh, minister He Shen and so, and the same uh, kind of events. So in my book, you will find about 60 pages with the identification of more than 300 items found in this way. So you can say the originals are not left. The originals uh, uh, the Tipao are not left. We have the Chinese versions of it and we have the translation in European sources so that to a certain extent already expands our knowledge of what appeared in this um, uh, Shang Yuda, in this uh, Tipao at that time. So let me now move to the topic itself and we start with, or I will focus mainly on uh, the Yongzheng uh, period. Uh, and I will um, tell you something about uh, the production and then about the distribution and then about reception. So first about uh, uh, production, uh, what is one of the major sources to European sources are the so-called Lettres Edifiantes Curieuses. Eh? That's an enormous series. And in the Lettres Edifiantes Curieuses, there are three letters by circonstance. Eh? who is not very well known, basically has no writing in Chinese and hardly anything in French, except these three letters. And that's about 300 pages, and they are basically only devoted to the Gazette. So what do we find in this? Uh, and you can see that was in um, uh, 1726 that it was written. So what do we find in these letters? In the first place, he gives a description of what is the content of a gazette. And you see here the list. Eh? He says, you will find the names of officials, criminal cases, expenses made, admonitions, rituals performed, and so on and so on. Very nice, because if you look at modern publications, you will basically find the same list. Eh? So he, he, he has a very good record of what was the content. Uh, as I mentioned uh, here again, I try to identify all the different uh, sources, and they are quite extensive. And if you want to know what is he translating, here you have a few examples. Uh, so that can be the end of three-year mourning and installation of the empress, uh, a text about a memorial archway, uh, uh, something rescue the people in years of bad harvest to relieve the poor, a death sentence, and so on. So a wide range of topics. These are, as you can notice, they are not related to Christianity at all. Um, he also gives information about the structure of the Tipo. So, and that corresponds well with what we know about these early Tipos. Namely, you first have the Lunin, and then the Shangyu, and then the Zhe, and then the Tizhou. I come back on that uh, later. And um, how can we prove it or how can we find whether that corresponds? In fact, so far, I only found one copy of what was the Tipao during the Yongzheng period. And that is this text that is in the Österreichische Nationalbibliothek in Vienna. As you can see, the title is not Tipao. The title is not King Pao. King Pao is much later. It is Ti Zhou Chuan Lu. Do we know whether that is the correct title at that time? I checked many databases, the Tiao Long database and so on. You will not find it. Only in Korean sources, you have this um, 
uh, Yen Ching Lu. These are the delegates, the yearly delegates from Korea going, going to uh, Beijing and they stay there for one or two months and then they go back and they write a report. And they have several records saying in the Tizhou Chuan Lu of today, it is mentioned this and this and this and this. And there is a note in the text, original note from that time, saying that this is Pen Woman de Chao Pao Yi Yang. It's the same as our official uh, um, newspaper. Maybe we have a second copy, and that's the glass here in the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris. They have a collection of minerals, and these minerals are in boxes or in this, this is closed, has never been opened, and you see some of these characters. And so we guess that this may be a copy that they are wrapped in one paper or so of the teapot. So they have not yet decided whether they want to open it or not, but let us hope that they open it and then we have a further confirmation. You see how the detect detective work uh, it implies to, to find your sources. Now, why do we know that this is really the Gazette of that time? Well, in fact, there is this important article by Pan Tianzhen, who already pointed out that during the Qianlong period, the most important, uh, well, the, the Ti Pao or Qin Pao, it was called Ti Zhou Shi Tian. Shi Tian here has the meaning of documents, uh, the documented or document, the, the Ti Zhou, uh, the, the memorials, uh, uh, they are documentation. And uh, it's only much later that the term King Paul was really uh, used. And in Paris, we have, from the Qianlong period, we have eight Osdiv copies. And you can see there is also the handwriting. And this is the handwriting of the missionary. And we have the French version of the text as well. And so the Tizhou Chuanlu is the forerunner of the Tizhou Shi uh, Tian. Uh, of the of yeah uh, this is uh, uh, so the this one is earlier and that that's why it is the forerunner of the Tito Chuan uh, uh, Shi Tian the Tito Chuan Lu is the is the forerunner of the Tito uh, Shi Tian okay so this is for the material side of the of the story so um, uh, furthermore. Uh, Contencin has information about the significance of the Gazette. Uh, namely, he says, yeah, um, what makes the Gazette of China very useful for the government is that instead of filling it, as is done in certain parts of Europe, with useless things and often with slander and calumny, it only mentions what relates to the emperor. This is very early. And we will see this remark repeated, repeated again. So they start to compare that with the European gazettes or newspapers at that time. And moreover, it points out that this is a very good means to instruct the people and the officials. Uh, moreover, he says, it really should repair, report what is said and what is done by the emperor. And then he has a very small sentence, and you will see how important this sentence will become. He writes, yeah, last year, two writers were sentenced to death for having inserted in the Gazette some circumstances which were false. Uh, the emperor went in the Yuan Yuan, and he had a meeting with some of the officials, and then they write that he went on the boat and that they got drunk and they had a whole feast and that was reported. And then the emperor said, no, that is not true as so one. And so they were condemned to death. But you see, it's only a small sentence, which fortunately I could identify in the original sources, uh, but that will be, become very important for what uh, follows. Uh, finally, he has some uh, personal uh, explanation uh, saying that, uh, yeah, this kind of cassette is very useful for the missionaries 
they really should ye- read it. And I spent already 20 years in China and I didn't do, do that before, but now I regret it because you find so much information about religion and laws and customs and language and so on and so on. Uh, and so uh, he also mentions, uh, yeah, yet the European missionaries as always neglected this reading because they do not know enough the language or because they associated with Europe where uh, anything is put in it, good and bad, without any dis- uh, distinction. And that's why they don't read it. So interesting remarks to see their uh, feelings about it. So this was the first um, uh, case, eh, but that's already 300 pages. And then there is another case, and these are manuscripts courses, uh, sources that are kept in the um, in the uh, Propaganda Fide, the archives of the Propaganda Fide in Rome. And what is particular here, so this person is living in Canton about the same uh, uh, time, and um, he, uh, they have um, uh, copied by hand some complete people. So that's very precious for us, because there you have not the original version, but the original Chinese text, eh? and also uh, 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 translated into um, Italian. So they also give information about the content and about the form. Uh, There are some differences, eh? because Contan Saint, he addresses it to an individual. Uh, 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 Contan Saint addresses it to an individual so that he can publish it. Eh, whereas uh, Peroni eh, has the internal report and that was never published. Eh? It was not spread uh, anywhere. And it's also quite unique because of the Chinese uh, text. So he also has the same personal considerations. He says, yeah, nor is there any danger that the story will be altered by the passion of the writer. And so insist on the same point. Uh, it is a report about what the emperor says and the uh, authors of the compilers of the uh, Tipo are not uh, allowed to, um, uh, to change it. Um, so is there any, any difference or what can we see? Uh, because they are, on one hand, they are reporting about all this, but there is also a vision that appears from uh, behind. Eh? And so... Um, Contensin, uh, he, um, uh, he, he uh, writes also about the emperor, and despite the persecution of Christianity, he has a quite laudatory description of the emperor uh, on the Yongzhong emperor. So he mentions that it is a wise government, that the emperor is in service of public utility, that there is an active bureaucracy, and we have to point out that this view is not necessarily shared by all the other missionaries uh, or Jesuit missionaries, but he is very positive uh, about it. Peroni, uh, he has a more mixed view, uh, because despite the persecution, he also has a positive view on the emperor and the bureaucracy, uh, he says that the emperor is good at lecturing and that he holds speeches to reproach his officials, that he is attentive to the needs of the people, that the bureaucracy is in communication with the emperor, and so on and so on. And so on one hand, quite positive, but he also has a negative view, more nuanced. Eh? He says that the emperor is blinded by his officials that in his speeches, that his speeches are disconnected from reality, that there is famine, but he doesn't know anything about it. His blind results in the cruel persecution of Christianity, and the bureaucracy is always flattering the emperor. And so that's a more nuanced uh, vision about it. So as a first, uh, this was the presentation, as a first kind of small conclusion, what can we see? Well, on the one hand, looking at from the periphery to the sources, we get to know something about the material side, about how was it constituted, and so on and so on. And also, we know something about the 
extent of these um, um, sources. So now the sources arrived in Europe. We mentioned that Peroni this manuscript was not this, but the Lettres et Défenses were public and they were published. So the question is, how far this what happened with this with this text? So here we can look at academic journals and newspapers and also some books. So in Europe at the time there were academic journals. Two famous journals are, eh, you can find uh, fully online, eh, eh, Le Journal des Savants and also Les Mémoires de Trévoux. Eh? And what is typical for these academic journals is that they make very long reviews of publications with a lot of excerpts. So this is a new way of distributing the same knowledge. And we find in them extensive quotes from these letters. So the letters or the knowledge about the Gazette is spread more widely than only by the Lettres et différentes écrivains. You have also some newspapers or some pamphlets. This is a book, uh, a newspaper called The Bee Revived. And in it, you find again the reference to the public gazette. And also, they are the reverse of European newspapers. And you find the reference to two writers that were condemned to death. So that apparently was an important aspect. Another publication is Description de la Chine four volumes, where it's an enormous uh, information, source of information about China. And there is a whole chapter on the Chinese government. Uh, and you can see this book was published in French, but also in English, in Russian, in German. Uh, and you have a whole section on the Gazette. Nothing is inserted in the Gazette, but what has reference to the government. Uh, it's aimed at instructing the officials. And again, a reference to our two writers who were condemned to death. Um, more information? Yes. At that time, there were some books on Chinese and world history. For instance, Histoire Générale de la Chine. This is a collection, uh, it's one work published in 13 volumes more than 7,000 pages. Uh, as you probably know, in European languages, you have the Cambridge History of China, and that's about the largest collection uh, about Chinese history in, in English at this moment. I think there are 150 persons, scholars, who worked on it. This work is published by one person. Translation from Chinese and from Manchu. And in fact, it's still the largest work on Chinese history, published by one person since the 16th or 17th century. And again, you have a whole section. And they used that information for the Yongzheng uh, Yong period. They used the information from the Gazette. Another work is also Marcy, eh, Histoire moderne des Chinois, again using these sources. So what can we say about this distribution? Um, and here I refer to Jürgen Ostel, uh, Osterhammel, uh, uh, who wrote uh, and writes, uh, Europe was well informed about the Gazette and about uh, uh, events in China. Well, that's, I'm writing that, but then the sentence from uh, uh, Osterhammel is, around the mid 18th century, the public in France and Germany was better informed about China than about many countries in on Europe's peripheries. So that's qu quite interesting to know they were informed by these sources. And what is typical for that time is that us, that Osterhammer, the war extensively shows that, that these sources are based on original Chinese texts. And of course, when you translate, there is also always interpretation. But there was a kind of attempt to let the sources speak for themselves. So to say, you want to know something about China? Duhalda also writes that. Well, the best way is that we translate Chinese sources. And that's what happens also with the Gazette. Uh, and as you probably know, 
In modern scholarship, we tend to analyze and to criticize as one, which is also a very interesting approach. But there is certain difference between that time and between our times, uh, uh, the description de la Chine, for instance, it's a memoir concernant le Chinois, on which I will come back. Uh, it's in, it very impressive how many texts, in fact, were translated directly from uh, Chinese. So this was the distribution. The next question is, but how was this information received? In fact, yeah, when you have it already in uh, in description or in this, uh, it's already a way of receiving. But how can we have yeah, very explicitly a uh, reception of this information about, uh, about the Gasset? And here we can uh, look at uh, the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Quenet, and uh, another text on which we come back. First is Voltaire. Uh, Voltaire uh, is, of course, one of the most important uh, Enlightenment thinkers. Eh? And what is interesting is that Voltaire wrote a lemma on the Gazette in the very famous Encyclopédie de Diderot. And that's the famous um, encyclopedia of Enlightenment thinking. So the section on the Gazette is written by Voltaire. And what does he write? He says, well, where comes the Gazette from? Uh, that comes from Italy, from Venice, uh, the name at least, uh, where you have to pay for one p a piece of paper uh, with some news, a uh, Gazetta. Yeah, but that was a coin. And then he adds, yes, but such journals have been established in China from time immemorial, and the Gazette of the Empire is printed every day by order of the court. So immediately joins the Chinese information in the uh, uh, Encyclopédie de Dito. So the first question is, did Voltaire read the sources that we have seen so far? We have proof of it. Why? Because the, uh, the, the library of um, Voltaire, after his, his death, was bought by Katerina from Russia and brought, brought to St. Petersburg. And in the 70s and the uh, 80s, uh, the Russian scholars were not allowed to do, let's say, uh, reflective work. So they did a lot of editing work and they published uh, collections uh, with all the notes in the books of Voltaire. So you have them directly access to it. And then I contacted them. And here you can see, these are the paper slips in the books, in the, um, the work, um, um, Lettres Différentes et Curieuses. And we can see the notes that he made regarding the Gazette. Like in this case, and here you have another uh, case that he's mentioning, and uh, that's handwriting of uh, Voltaire. So we know that he read these uh, sources. Um, so what does he write about the Gazette? Uh, in his most famous book, Essai sur les mer uh, uh, mœurs et uh, l'esprit des nations, that book is very, very important in terms of history because Voltaire, that's a, a, a world history, and instead of putting the Middle East and, and the, the place of where uh, Christ and, and uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac and so were. No, he puts China first. He says that was most ancient country at that time. And he has reference to the uh, Gazette. The Journal of the Chinese Emperor is the most authentic and useful newspaper in the world since it contains the details of all the public needs, resources, interests of all the orders of the state. And so he gives a lot of information, eh, or he uses a lot of information about the Chinese government, the imperial system, and so on. And what happens is that Voltaire is thinking is about what is the ideal government, and he uses this information of China to construct his own view on the ideal government, and not on itself, but on the ideal government in his idea. So he writes, the new emperor surpassed his father in the love of laws and the public good. No emperor encouraged agriculture more. And there is a whole dis dispute in France. Uh, 
uh, the different types of government, and you have among them the despotic government, and you have a monarchy and a despotic government as one. Well. And so they discuss on whether China is a despotic government or not. And so according to Voltaire, there is no evidence of a despotic or arbitrary government because you have a monarch who governs relying on subordinated administrative boards. And so he praises the examination system and how everything uh, uh, acts through the system of the bureaucracy. And so that's his uh, opinion about it. We move to Montesquieu. Um, yeah, in my book, it's much longer, but I just give a few ideas about it. Montesquieu, um, uh, we have, again, the same references whether to, to as a proof that he read the Lettre édifiante et curieuse. So, and that's in the manuscript, uh, the Geo, uh, Geographica. Uh, he is uh, the opposite view uh, in this discussion. Um, he, an argument, he uses it as an argument uh, also regarding the ideals of a, a governance. And he puts, he points out at the limits of the juridical system. So he writes the following, the author praises the Gazette, the author that means Cossin, and the author of, uh, of the, of the, um, uh, of the Lettre de Fionte Curieuse, praises the Gazette of Peking printed every day. Nothing is put into it that has, been, has not been presented to the emperor. We have seen these sentences before. And then he writes, two writers were published with death for putting false circumstances. The judgment of the tribunal was founded on the fact that they had been disrespectful, disrespected the emperor, which is a capital crime. And then comes the remark by Montesquieu, nothing so dangerous as these vague laws, the disrespect, the disrespect is an arbitrary thing. So he uh, is very much uh, opposed to an arbitrary juridical system. And so he, he uses that case, you remember that was just one sentence in the 300 pages, and that is always repeated over and over again, uh, to make his own argument. Um, so he writes uh, in Esprit des Lois, uh, if the crime of high treason be indeterminate, this alone is sufficient to make the government degenerate in an arbitrary power. So he is of the opinion that China is a despotic state whose principles are to fear. And so that's an opposite view than uh, Voltaire. And then we have Kenet, which is an other um, a thinker, uh, enlightenment thinker, a so-called uh, physiocrat, and physiocrat uh, that refers to those who are interested in especially agriculture, the agricultural uh, economy. Uh, uh, China was really a model for agriculture economy uh, at that time for European thinkers. And he has a whole text on, um, uh, on the, um, the des uh, despotisme de la Chine, but as you will see here, the name of despotism is different than under uh, Montesquieu because he speaks about a legitimate despotism, <laughs> namely where the legitimacy is manifested both in the memorial, in the moral and economic laws of the emperor and in their control of absolute power. So he advocated the Chinese meritocratic uh, selection of official instead of the French aristocratic system. It says we are we in France we have this aristocracy and look at China they have an examination system. This is not a barbarian government. Its fundamental constitution was entirely independent from the emperor. So that's their view, and you see how they are debating among each others not in the first place about China, partly about China, but about their own view on what could be a good government and using the Chinese case 
which as source are the information about the gadgets that were transmitted. Uh, and here again, you have the case of the two writers. The two writers were sentenced to death for having inserted facts that were false. So uh, the law of China in China permits the practice of remonstra uh, remonstration of the emperor. So he also uses an other case uh, where he says there is perhaps no country where the sovereign can be remonstrated with more liberty than in China. Uh, so this is the opinion of Kene at that time. I come to the fourth case. This is no longer uh, thinkers, the French thinkers of the uh, Enlightenment, but the first freedom of press and expression act in Europe. That was a Swedish act voted by the parliament in 1766. And there were two scho uh, scholars, member of the Swedish parliament, and they wanted to submit a law to protect the freedom of writing, freedom of written expression, and freedom of the press. And they had to find some arguments. And where did they find their arguments? In Description de la Chine, the arguments were the Chinese Gazette. And they said, we have to do like in China, because in China you have the freedom of the press. And we have to adopt that, and that's why we have to vote this uh, law. Eh? And this is what happened. Eh? The freedom of writing of the press and of the information had been in existence in China since ancient times and had contributed substantially to the wealth and stability in China. So these are texts from that time eh, where they say, and we have to do that, and that's how in Europe you had the first law on the freedom of uh, writing and of the press. So, as you can see, eh, you have different uh, uh, opinions. This is the reception. They base themselves on the information from the Gazettes. These are the same sources. Uh, Voltaire and Kenet have a rather positive view on it. Montesquieu is negative view. And uh, the two uh, parliamentary parliament members of uh, Sweden, they use it uh, actively to promote the freedom of the press. Uh, I quote again Osterhammel, eh, who says, uh, very often we have been talking in about Europe, you have the uh, xenophobia, the xenophilia, eh, with those who like China, who reject China. And he says, yeah, the objection that China was an idealized in xenophile text, which drew the in, uh, information be, be mainly from the description of Lachine, may be correct, but misses the point. Okay? He says, the Chinese bureaucracy in the first half of the 18th century was indeed perhaps the best functioning in the world. Okay? And part of this bureaucracy was the Gazette. So they were, they said, yeah, but here you have real official gazette with the official decisions that we do not have in the same way in Europe at that time. Moreover, reports on the Middle Kingdom gave European theorists the first opportunity to come to grips in a detailed way with the problems of administration and governments. And that's what I've been pointing out, namely, it's true, these translations through the information about the gazettes, that they started no, not they started, that, they, that this, the, this information allowed them to think about what could be an ideal government and this kind of dialogue that was taking, uh, taking place. Uh, before coming to a conclusion, I just mentioned very briefly also the Qianlong uh, period. In my book, I have maybe 50 or 60 pages about it, but I want just to mention, yeah, there is still so much more information, especially about the Chen uh, uh, long period. Uh, you have the series Memoirs Concernant les Chinois, uh, that's in total uh, 15 volumes, in which you have all these translations of text. Uh, in it, you find uh, 300 pages on the notion of Xiao, only based translations of Chinese text. Uh, till now, the largest treatise on Xiao in any European language. Um, and in it, you will find 
a lot of information also, translations and descriptions of the Gazette. These were sent by Amyo, a Jesuit in Beijing. He worked together, we have the name of the Chinese with whom he worked together because many of these sources were uh, produced in collaboration with Chinese scholars. And he sent that to Bertin. Uh, Bertin was uh, the state's minister and um, they had about 30 years of correspondence and so they sent information and he was asking information and they sent all this information back and among that uh, information sent to Europe were these few pages of the uh, Tito um, Shetien that are in the um, National Library in uh, Paris. And I just want to make reference to this it's about the Seku Chuanchu. So at that time, Europeans knew exactly, well, or had access to information about the whole production of the Seku Chuanchu. Eh? And they translate parts of the, uh, of the Tito uh, Shi Tian, in which it is said that uh, two uh, uh, children of, um, of the Tianlong Emperor, they were among the correctors, but if they make mistake or if they they did not correct the mistake. Eh? Uh, they should be punished in the same way as all the others. Eh? And the emperor regularly took a few copies of the transcripts, uh, transcriptions, and then he checked whether there were no mistakes, and if there were mi mistakes, they were punished, and so on. All this is in the in the um, Gazette, and it is uh, can be found in the French sources. Moreover, eh, Bertin says. Yeah, and I talked about it with the uh, with, uh, uh, French king, and he found it was so interesting. Eh? And the king has read all the extracts of the gazettes eh, with pleasure. Of course, this is a small note, but you see that the exchange about it. And Bertin writes, oh, but this collection of the Seku Chuanchu is really very interesting. We should have one. Can we ask them? to give us a copy, and in exchange, we can give them tapestries and gobelins and mirrors. I take this as an example eh, on how open-minded some of these people were and said, we should have this Chinese information coming uh, to Europe at that time. Uh, even if he himself did not master Chinese language, he at least was aware that Europe could learn from it. Moreover, there is another bourgeois, eh, and he uh, wrote to Bertin and said, you really want to know what uh, is written in, uh, in the Gazette? I will translate you three months of it. And he translated three months of the Gazette, complete translation, uh, uh, which uh, can be found as a manuscript in Paris. All these sources are uh, available. And you can see here, it's a long uh, year. Let me come to a conclusion. I tried to approach this topic from two perspectives. The first was looking at a culture from the periphery, the other interconnected cultural history. I hope that I was able to show you eh, how these European sources are, of course, not the only sources, but at least they also expand the knowledge about the Gazette and, of course, also the knowledge about how uh, Europeans were reading uh, the Gazette in China itself. B moreover, it was an interconnected history. Uh, instead of only looking at the Gazette, what happened in China, we saw how it was distributed in Europe, but also was read in Europe and how people started to think about European issues from the perspective uh, of uh, China. And uh, yeah, that is my final uh, conclusion. Eh? Uh, through the translations of this Gazette, eh, that gave European uh, readers access to uh, knowledge about the Qing art of governing. They otherwise they would otherwise have been denied. Eh? If we did not have these translations of the Gazette, probably they would not have known so much about it. Already in the 18th century, Chinese Gazette joined a global public. Thank you very much for your attention.
interesting and also insightful uh, lecture on uh, intercultural you know, history and cultural exchange between Europe. And you see Europe as a global public already, yeah? even though maybe some people. That's uh, yeah. So far, I think we have uh, from the Zoom, I think a lot of people, but no question raised. So I think here we, we leave the opportunity for uh, the live audience. Uh, we have only 15, 20 minutes, I think. Uh, if you like to raise a question, please uh, raise your hand and then also uh, uh, could you tell us also your name and also yeah. briefly, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. um, good afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Sander. Thank you, uh, Professor Yang. Uh, I want to, uh, yes, yeah, I graduated from the University in the Department of Science. And uh, uh, last you mentioned about your topic, I want to ask you one question on the perspective of poverty. You know that poverty is about the interest, and uh, this is very key point between the two countries or two, uh, I mean that between China and Europe. You um, you are pretty you are a topic in the um, perspective of intellectual or philosophy, I still want to be in the politicism. Yeah. So I want to know how the Jinbao Bao um, influence the political decision um, from Europe to China. You know, that uh, Magari is a uh, diplomatic duty to Qing to Qing dynasty. This is very sorry. Yeah, this is a very important event. But uh, um, from the time, you know, the, at, the, at that time, the European countries can get the Deepa at that time. Yeah, so I want to use your put the uh, Bota and the Madagascar as an example. But I want to know how it improved, uh, influenced that in the diplomatic event just between the two countries or two. Uh, political institutions. Yes, thank you. Yeah, the, the diplomatic relationships. Yeah. Um, uh, let's say I'm I'm not often using the word influence because uh, for me it's a kind of interaction from which certain things emerge, and so it's not that you have the the gasset and that has a direct influence on politics. No. It creates a sphere of information okay, where ideas start to circulate. Now, uh, I must say that I'm not very well aware to what extent um, the McCartney expedition was within these discussions related to the King Paul. I, I don't know that should be investigated. What I know is that you have here Bertin. And so that's the Qianlong, especially the Qianlong period. And because earlier in the Yongzheng period, you did small these intellectual discussions. For the, the uh, later period, so we are talking about the 70, 70s, 80s until the 1790s, and so about 20 years, uh, an important figure was Henri Bertin. And Henri Bertin has direct link to a direct access to the French king. And you have commercial exchange with China. And they are related to this commercial exchange. And so in the, in the text, the manuscript text used by Bertin, he will say, ah, can you write me a little bit more about that person? Uh, the cover of my book has a picture of, of one of the officials. So Bertin asked, can you send me big designs of these people? One of them in the south was condemned. And then he said, oh, what happened with this person? So you have this kind of, let's say, direct links. Uh, and I think that this created an atmosphere, at least for France, where there was a lot of openness 
to contacts with China. I gave the example of uh, of the ID that he wanted to have a copy of the Seco Chuancho. But at that time, you did not have um, um, a French, uh, let's say, delegation in the same way as the McCartney expedition to China. So it's a rather general answer in the sense that you create a whole atmosphere of knowledge. But I, do, I did not investigate the direct link. All right, there's a hand over there. Thank you so much, Professor. And you mentioned about some general thoughts about Chinese administration system at the time. And I wonder, uh, are there any very specific events or uh, issues that uh, maybe reported in the debate? And uh, what the Europeans at that time knew those very specific events? I never read the book, I never read the book, and there are so many different issues. Yeah, and uh, it's my question. You also identify yourself? Yeah, very Your name? Okay. <laughs> my name is Chen Jian, and I'm the, uh, I'm the graduate of the history of art. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so there are many, many different topics in it. Eh? I mentioned only a short list for the Yung Jiang period, but these are 300 pages. In my book, I have 60 pages, only identifying all the different topics. And they go in, in, in political events, they go in cultural events that can go about uh, uh, the famine. Uh, you have a whole uh, part in the manuscript about the, um, yeah, the war and the conflicts in Taiwan, for instance. A very interesting uh, section about that. So, yeah, you have a lot of information that is uh, used and sent to Europe about it. Uh, but then you also have this, uh, let's say, more bureaucratic or information. So these are translations. Eh? But uh, the uh, Amio, uh, uh, Contencin, and so on, they also give information about the functioning of the Chinese uh, uh, bureaucracy. So there is a very long text on the system of the examination system. And you also you have these records of all the uh, every three months they published a list with all the different the changes in the positions of the of the important uh, uh, officials every three months that was published in chinese and some of these copies were sent to france and uh, at least one should have been translated we i did not find the translation but so and all this to inform the Bertin, the, the advisor of the uh, French king, to see here, look at how the Chinese bureaucracy works. Yeah. Can I find those France primary sources uh, on the website? Um, <laughs> uh, most well, we have a book yeah. exhibition, I think, in our library at this yeah. time. And then we do uh, have some like uh, old books published the manuscript published in European languages. I, I'm not sure we have all the sets of translation. Uh, you you have uh, the website of the French National Library, uh, yeah, Gallica. I have, I have yeah, and there you'll find a lot. And but not all the Chinese sources have been um, yeah, digital uh, digitalized. So then, yeah, you have to go to France. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice trip. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. And then you have also Latin, Spanish, and German, and all these languages. Uh, Professor Four. Because the Europeans were not only getting information from the Ima, they already knew quite a lot from Chinese sources, and they had years of knowledge accumulated from the Jesuit missions to China. So your, your newspaper knowledge from China is really being overlaid on a very, very solid 
background already. So if you take that into consideration, where would you put it? the Jadima, the sort of body you're talking about today? So I think you are right that it is somehow overloaded, and that's yeah part of the yeah the survey I made. I started to, is this used, and then I just was it also distributed, and then was it also received, and then of course I only focused on the references of the Gazette. For instance, in Voltaire, and Voltaire writes much more about China and also from other sources. And so I completely acknowledge uh, that, that it's part of, yeah, I would say even f a, fun, <laughs> a fun survey that you really follow one, one line. Uh, and uh, yeah, the idea behind was it, yeah, basically, basically nobody had written about did the Europeans right. use the Gazette and what happened with that. And then you start to discover all these links. Eh? But that's also a bit the limit of, of the research. Um, but um, where do we have to situate it in uh, for the enlightenment, I would say? Um, there I would still say that yeah, you have description de la Chine, eh, in which you have much more than only the Gazette. But these three letters by Comte Contensin, they provide so much information about the, yeah, the, the daily activities of an emperor that you do not find in the same way in other printed sources. And so the missionaries sometimes uh, express their own functioning within the palace and, and their relationship with the emperor, but that's more in private letters than in published letters. Um, so, in that regard, the, yeah, the, the discussions about yeah, um, what is that now despotism or not is still to a large ex extent based on this relatively few sections of sources, the three letters by Contensa and the, dis the uh, description in Description de la Chine. Okay. Of course, when we talk about, let's say, Chinese morality, there are other texts in, um, in Description de la Chine. When uh, we have about, uh, yeah, let's say, the, the arts and the techniques and technology, you have other sources. Eh? But the more political there, there, the importance of the Gazette is still quite high. I, I, don't, I don't dare to say how much percentage or so, but it's quite um, quite significant, yeah. yeah. Oh, and any more questions? I think the uh, cultural uh, history between China and 17th or 18th century Europe, uh, we will, at uh, this lecture, focus only on the uh, uh, Gazette and the translation of the Gazette. But also, like uh, we, we know, the volumes of uh, Jesuit correspondences will provide more uh, information, but not exactly on the activities of uh, the emperor. Mm -hmm. And and also, like uh, the question of who even life persons uh, or, or servants of Jesuits could also be uh, the passage, I think, uh, through which I think uh, that uh, China and Europe inform each other. Any? If there's another question, I think you, you, your polit political question. Huh? <laughs> okay, we have uh, Dr. Lee. There is a shift of opinion about China uh, from a positive way to a negative way between the 18th century and 19th century. Um, and uh, the source of their knowledge probably was a, uh, uh, a crucial factor behind this shift. And what do you think is reason behind this shift uh, about uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese culture and Chinese government, Chinese system? Mm -hmm. Uh, I must say that I'm quite uh, impressed or um, by the book by uh, Oster Hamel, which I mentioned, who is not only looking at uh, China, but at 
the whole of Asia. So from, let's say, the Middle East until the Far East, to the extent that we can use these words. And he noticed that around 1800, there is a kind of shift in, um, in, from an inclusive Eurocentrism to an exclusive Eurocentrism. So Europe has, yeah, has been Eurocentric, but before 1800, there is a kind of uh, interest and activities and publications that is inclusive in the sense that, yeah, even if we look at it from the perspective of Europe, we want to learn from the others. And that's what happens with China also. And that, that suddenly you, you, they say, oh, and we have to learn that and look at what China is doing. Now, for me, the crucial person uh, period, now when I focus on, on Europe, the crucial uh, period is between the McCartney expedition and let's say 18, yeah, the 1839 and the, the Opium War. In that period, what happens? So McCartney goes to China and Chen Wu Emperor basically says, we don't need uh, what you, you bring us. And to a certain extent, he was right eh? because he had a civil tension. He had a bureaucracy. There were problems, but that worked quite well. He had the economy. There were problems, but that worked quite, quite well. Europe was looking and seeing. Uh, he had palaces with reproduction of even Versailles. He had paintings, everything you, you more or less wanted. I'm exaggerating a bit, but that's to enter into his mind. <clears throat> but then, uh, after this McCartney expedition, it's not due to McCartney expedition. You have to look at what happens in Europe. You have the French Revolution. You have uh, the, the Napoleonic Wars. So Europe is in war at that, at that time. There are hardly any missionaries coming to China. There is the development of um, the, the industrialization that starts. There is the whole idea of progress. There is the uh, applied sciences that enter in modern universities. They, they are no longer Renaissance, they are no longer, uh, but a new concept of universities. All this is happening in a period of about 40 years, more or less, in which China and Europe have very few contacts. And then the British come back with steamships, no longer the other ships. And so you have the whole idea of progress, steamships and trains. And there they come to China and yeah, with the open war, they impose themselves, which is another story. But what happens is that this kind of world vision or culture and so, and I look now from the perspective of China, no longer fits with the Chinese traditional culture because the bureaucracy, the examination system to which the Europeans looked and they, they admired them. Yeah, what you need in that new society is to learn languages. You need investors for uh, uh, um, to, 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 make, um, to make your uh, train system. You need uh, uh, engineers. You, uh, you cannot say, okay, you learn the classics by heart during 30 years and then, no, you need completely different. And there, there is also a shift eh, that took place not only with China, but with other parts in the world eh, where uh, yeah, the more positive view changes in a negative view or a view to say, yeah, what can China tell us? So it's this kind of conflict that happened in a period of about 40, 40 years. Okay, yeah, I understand. What was it for? Yeah, 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 yeah. The one thing we have not mentioned in those 30 years is that absolutism had fallen out of favor in Europe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. After Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The absolutism yeah. no longer controlled the press. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that have been the bigger shift? 
Well, I, I think it's one of the shifts yeah, that, took, that took place. Yeah, you have a new concept also of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the um, yeah, I'm, I'm from Belgium, and, and that was at that when we are a very young state, and that's 1830, and that was a constitutional uh, parliament, a constitutional parliament. So it's not the king who is the most important, it's the par parliament. Huh? That, that was very, very modern at that time, eh? where, where you have all these different new, but all this comes together eh? because it's, yeah, it's economy. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, also with, with uh, Napoleon bes besides the war, but you have the uh, Napoleonic uh, code, eh? which regulates the whole administration until today. Eh? So these are, really new concepts of a society that uh, yeah that that brings the whole thing in another balance eh? all right time is almost uh, up so I, I i think if anyone would like to ask the last question if you want give you another minute no yeah. uh, no sir um yeah sorry about it i, I think my question is very um um, on the first, uh, on the start of your lecture, I remember you mentioned uh, 1800 is a very important year, right? Uh, 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 that period. So I, I mean that, that. I mean that uh, uh, you you mentioned people uh, deal with the document after the 1800, and then you you want to share you want to share the uh, the way to deal with the materials, right? Um, so uh, I want to know that how you, what is the specific uh, um, skill details about the two pieces of uh, materials and uh, how you deal with that uh, specifically? Yeah. So it, it is not the year 1800, eh? it is around 1800, because the, for instance, the Tito uh, Shikien, uh, that goes until I think uh, 1805 or 1815, and so uh, so it's it's a bit it's around that that period. The point is that from the let's say the Western European point of view, is that regarding to the Gazette, we have many European English sources because from the 1830s many of them are translated into English. And that is related to the existence of the Qing Pao. So that coin, 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 uh, that's coin, coincident. Uh, before that, we, I thought there were no translations. And you have a different type of Ti Pao, which is not the Qing Pao, but which is the Ti Zhou Chuan Lu. And the Tito uh, uh, Shi So that makes, regarding to my topic, the difference. But in order to do that, and that's a methodological question, inspired also by uh, uh, this Professor Pan. So we often have to forget about the King Pao. <coughs> what I did in the beginning, I, I had the King Pao in mind. But sometimes you have to say, no, I forget about it. And I tried to find what was specifically for the period before. So that's kind of methodological uh, way of doing. Uh, forget about about what we have in our mind. All right, just a piece of information. I think at CUHK, I think we have a translation uh, a department. We have a research team uh, 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 working on uh, the relationship between uh, history and also the translated material, starting with uh, uh, 1780, 1790s in mm -hmm. the Maca Macaulay mission, uh, led by Professor uh, Wang, uh, Wang, Wang Ji, I think Lawrence Wang. Uh, I think yes. they they, yeah. pub they, they, yeah. they, yeah, yeah. they published they have several volumes yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, mm. uh, but then the Q and A and the dialogue could continue on for forever, yeah. and you you still have your your chance because Professor Standard will be uh, give, uh, delivering the second lecture and the third lecture, and the second one on Friday and the third one on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So um, we. 
I'd like to show our appreciation and our thanks to him for today's very first lecture. Thank you, very much. Thank you for your time. Professor Lund for this inspiring talk. And thank you all again for coming. Professor Standard will be delivering two more lectures on Friday in CUHK and Sunday at the Hong Kong Central Library. So please feel free to come again. You can find the details of the lecture in the booklet. And lastly, please help us to fill out the questionnaire by sending a QR code on the screen. Thank you and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Testing, 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 testing. Can you testing, 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 testing? Can you? This one, but the first one is not. This one also has a jump. Okay, you know, that's so clear. I just got it. The first one is like this. The first one is like this. Testing, testing. I can't even click. My first one is like this. We click here. 即係就算唔咩嘅話，我哋夾喺度都應該收得好好嘅，所以我先至覺得好奇怪。而家就係試緊咯，因為我啲 cut 我可以 cut 啊嘛 ，testing testing 係收曬佢，可以收 testing testing testing。Hello hello， 冇聲嘅咩？有路啊！頭先，但係頭先係冇嘅喎，頭先係好細咯，頭先而家都好細啊。但係嗰陣時我哋叫佢哋啲講師係咁樣 clip 喺度，即係以前未有。未有呢個嘅時候係 keep 喺度嘅。唔係啊，我係覺得咧，白色量就係貴啲，呢個唔使。量冇所謂嘅，總之量。